A show of hands, how many of you know companies that implement some sort of security because the company needs to comply with certain regulations, GDPR, PCI, DSS? So the majority, uh, which, exact, which is exactly what I see a lot of out there. And at this point, the security in most of the cases is a checkbox and is there in place for compliance regulations reasons. The security team will come up and create compliance policies which contain security vulnerabilities each company is interested to comply with. SQL injection, cross-site scripting, or any other type of vulnerability each company is interested to comply with. In most of the cases, um, there are the OASP top 10. Uh, okay. In most of the cases, some of the OASP top 10 or even all of the OASP top 10. And now we have these compliance policies that then are used to check your software. And for this, uh, they sometimes are, are used static code analysis or SUST, dynamic code analysis or DUST or even manual penetration testing. And then the reports are compiled, usually huge reports that contains lots of vulnerabilities and sent to you, the developers, to fix them. How many of you received those huge reports in an unfriendly format in most of the cases for you to sort out? And I totally understand you how you feel because this is exactly what happened to me in my previous job. When I joined as a newbie, and so soon after I joined that company, I was given a manual penetration testing report and asked to sort out all those flaws, which were not quite a few. So we have all of these flaws now in this huge report to sort out. And at that point, there is a shift because as developers, we, 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 are, we start thinking of those vulnerabilities. And we, start, we want to make those vulnerabilities disappear from our software. The problem with this approach of thinking of vulnerabilities is that we still produce a high number of insecure application and injection, for example, is still king. In the latest OASP, top, uh, in the latest OASP top 10 2017, the injection is still in pole position. And there is a problem because we can test for these security vulnerabilities only after we have done the software, after we have written the software. After all, you cannot check, for example, for SQL injection until you actually have written that piece of code that makes the interaction with the database. So the question is, can we do something else about this? Is there any other way that we can look at this problem? And this is what we will explore as part of this presentation where we will look at security vulnerabilities from a different angle. We will decompose the vulnerabilities into the security controls that prevent them, are familiar to you, and you can use them while you write the code. And instead of focusing on these security vulnerabilities, which can be measured only at the end, after the software has been developed, which is way too late, to focus instead on the security controls that we have identified. And you can verify and you can use them from the beginning in your software. A little bit about myself, my name is Katie Anton and I come from a software development background. This is when I actually joined as project co-leader the OASP top 10 proactive controls because for me and for my team the OASP top 10 did not work. The OASP top 10 proactive controls is a project for developers that should be used in any software development project. I currently work as application security consultant at Veracode, and as part of this role, I help developers around the world on how to secure their code, on how to correctly fix various vulnerabilities found in their software. In uh, the way we measure the security of an uh, application 
is using uh, primarily the common weaknesses enumeration, or for short, CVE. And probably this is something that you've heard a lot security professionals talking about, CWE. And what is this? This is a formal list that gives a common language to describe the software security weaknesses which have been introduced at architecture, design, and during the code. So this is what is the CWs, various security weaknesses introduced in the software at various stages. The CWE have been studied for a long time. They have been organized, classified, which come from architecture, which are introduced at code level. And actually, there is a nice classification which you can find on MVD database. The point of this one is not for you to uh, look at in detail, but the point that I'm trying to make is that there has been a lot of classification and analysis of all this CWE. But for the purpose of this presentation, let's go a little bit more in detail into one of these categories. And I will start with the biggest one, which is the injection category, which is still one of the most common vulnerabilities found in software applications today. As a category, this is a broad category, contains multiple types of injections. And you have command injection, cross-site scripting, XML, code injection, CRLF, LDAP injection, SQL injection, just to name a few injections. And if we go into any of these, actually, there is further classification. For example, in the case of the SQL injection, depending on how the attack is performed, you can have inbound injection when you have the attack and the exploit on the same, in the same channel or out of band injection. So there are lots of classification types of injection and it can become overwhelming for you as developers to think of all of these types when you write your code. And I know from my experience as developer that there, it is impossible to actually, when you write your code and your entire focus is to deliver that particular functionality, you cannot think of all of these types of injections and vulnerabilities that are out there. So the question is, is there anything else that we can do? Is there another way to deal with this? To answer this question, I will start with a very basic definition of what the injection is. So we go back to the basics. So if we go to the very basics, the injection occurs when you have some data, which is then combined with a sort of a syntax. And that result is sent to a parser. So the data, which is not only from a get or post, but also from every file upload, HTTP headers, also data from devices like database configuration files. So all this data from a wide variety of sources is combined with a sort of a syntax and is sent to a parser. So if we want to store the data to the database, then that will be sent to the SQL parser. If we want to render a page, a web page, that is sent to an HTML parser or the browser and so on. And that's when we end up with the initial data, the input, which is executed as part of that code on that output. So the next one, I would like to focus a little bit on this output, the bit, the red bit, because that's where we end up with the code, the data which is executed as part of the code. So I like to take this view and flip it so we can focus on that, the, the red part. So in the case of the SQL injection, you create the command by having data which is combined with the SQL query. But the best defense to prevent the SQL injection 
is to parameterize the data. By separating the data from the actual SQL query, when that is sent to the parser, the parser know which is the actual input and which is the actual SQL command. And the defense happens at the parser level. This is why the data, data query parameterization is the best defense for SQL injection because the defense happens at the parser level. But as defense in that, we still have to validate the input. In the case of the cross-site scripting, this occurs when you have input combined with to create the HTML page. The best defense for this is to contextually encode that output to neutralize the characters that can trigger the code execution. So for this reason, the output encoding is the primary defense and um, input validation, we still have to apply it as defense in that. And similarly for XML injection, code injection, LDAP injection, and command injection. So instead of focusing of all those type of vulnerabilities that you will end up having into your reports, what I would like you to focus instead of which are the security controls that help us to prevent those vulnerabilities in the first place. And use as a primary, for example, to prevent injection as a primary, the data parameterization. If that's available, if that's not available, then use the encoding. And as defense in that, we still have to validate the input because if we do these two consistently, you might prevent a vulnerabilities that you might not necessarily be aware of. A good example of this is a second order SQL injection. This is a type of injection where the injection payload is recorded and stays dormant until in the database until it finds the right environment to be exploited. So let's move on to another category. The next category that I would like to discuss are the intrusion or better said, the lack of intrusion detection. The problem that we see out there quite a bit is that fair logins, um, high value transactions, and other critical data is not logged. If there is some sort of logging, then another problem is that the format of the logs is not consistent enough within a company to allow the operations team to aggregate all of those logs, centralize them, and process them in a reasonable amount of time to get some meaningful data for any suspicious activity. To put it simply, uh, if a pen tester is able to get into a system, that is a very good indication that there is not enough logging and monitoring in place for that particular system. So the question is, what can you, as developers, do about this? For this, you have the security logging. This is the control that will help you to log security information during the runtime operation of an application. So let's go a little bit uh, more in details to see what exactly I mean about this security logging. There is a very nice um, project, OASP project, called AppSensor. And that has two parts. One of them is a tool and the other one is the documentation. And according to that project, there are six types of detection points which are considered good attack identifiers. And these are authorization and authentication failures, client side input validation bypasses, whitelist input validation failures, obvious code injection attacks, like when somebody sends an, an obvious SQL injection string or cross site scripting injection string, and a high rate of function use. This is when you have a high number of requests for a certain page in a very short period of time. 
Let's go a little bit more in details in some of this to give you an example of what I mean and what exactly you can do when you go back to your companies. So in the, uh, in the case of the input, if your application expects to receive post, but instead it receives get, that's a very good indication that somebody has intercepted that communication, intentionally changed from post to get, and that type of anomaly, that exception should be logged. This is something that a pen tester might do as well, because what they can do if they change from post to get, they can actually automate um, those. So that's something that a pen tester would do. Another one is additional form or URL parameters. And another thing that a pen tester would do, let's say, would add debug equal true. So if you detect on the, on the server side the fact that you have extra parameters, that's a good indication that that was intentionally added. So that type of exception, again, should be logged. In the case of authentication, if extra parameters, form or URL parameters, are sent to during the authentication. And something that the pen tester, again, will do is try admin equal true. Let's see what happens if on top of these variables that I have sent, I also send admin equal true. If this is detected, this is another type of exception that should be logged. Or the example of the application ex expects to receive two variables, the username and password, but instead it receives only one of them because the, the username, because the password has been removed. This is another type of exception that should be logged. Let's move on to some examples of input exceptions. And the Let's consider that the input validation on the server side fails, despite the fact that there is a client side validation. As an example of this, a thing that you have created a form, in one of the elements for that form, you have a maximum length defined. However, when that string reaches the server, the length is greater than what it was defined in the client side in the form. This is a very good indication that somebody has intercepted that since it has left the client, intentionally changed that particular string. So that type of exception as well should be logged. Or when the validation on the server side fails for non-user editable fields, radio buttons, checkboxes, hidden fields. A very good example for this is on an e-commerce application at the, on the shopping basket, if there is a hidden field price, that, that can be very tempting to play with. So that as well should be validated on the server side to ensure that it is the value that is expected. And during my previous job, I've actually asked my developers to break their own code, the one that actually they have created. Uh, after they got some basic training into how to, some basic tools like Burp to use them, intercept communication and change the data. And during that exercise, the developer that was working on the e-commerce side actually discovered that he could act, purchase items without paying the VAT because he did not validate it on the server side, that particular hidden field. So that's something that you can also do when you go back. See, try to break your own code and see how, how many of these hidden fields you validate it and then try to validate and put in place this kind of errors um, and log, log exceptions. <clears throat> now, these are just a few examples. There are more into the AppSensor project. But if we are to recap from these two type of categories that we have discussed by now, injection and intrusion detection, if we are to map a, a basic workflow, 
every time we ha our application receives data, we should validate it. Any exceptions, we should log. Because by logging and putting these in exceptions in place, what we are actually doing is we give the software the mechanisms to respond in real time to these possible identified attacks, the ones that we have identified. And we can reduce or even stop these attacks depending on how we choose the software to behave at that point. Any output, you should contextually encode it to neutralize the characters that can trigger the code injection. And any time we store data into the database, we should parameterize it by to separate the data from your actual command. The next category that I will tackle is the sensitive data exposure. And I will look at both data at rest and in transit. Now, when it comes to data at rest, well, there are two types of data that we need to store. One is the one where we need to know the initial value, like credit card, and that would be, uh, that must be encrypted. And the other one is where we don't need to know the initial value, uh, like password, user password, and that should be hashed. And every data that is transferred in transit, that should be done over an encrypted channel. When it comes to encrypting data at rest, a challenge that I see out there is how to correctly implement this and how to actually store securely the keys that is used then for encrypting, decrypting that particular uh, data. And I'll go through an example that I've discovered in one of my consultations when during the uh, review of a piece of software, we discovered that in a in the same folder, there are two files. One of them, encrypted password, kind of, kind of guess what it was. It was the actual encrypted data. But the other one was quite intriguing, the password entities, which when we open, it contained three <laughs> elements. A seed, a salt, and iterations, which turn out that all of these were used in conjunction with the password based key derivation function, which is a hashing algorithm to generate the key. So, in the same folder, we had both the encrypted data and everything we needed to actually generate that key for that data. So, if an attacker would get access to that particular folder, they could have everything. The data encrypted were the credentials for the database, so he could actually get access to the database as well. So happy days for everyone. So this is an example of a vulnerability at design stage. So like I told you, there are three types of weaknesses. This is one of those, uh, not at the code, but at design. It takes a little bit longer to actually do it correctly. But when we encrypt data, we need to ensure that we still use a strong cryptographic algorithm and AES is still there, but we have to store the key completely separately from the encrypted data. And we have to actually protect the keys in dedicated bolsters. Now the keys are the secrets. Uh, they are used to encrypt and decrypt the data, so they have to be protected in dedicated key vaults. And we have to avoid as much as possible these homegrown solutions because they can so easily go wrong in the case of encryption. It's also important to define a key life cycle and have in the software implemented the ability to actually change algorithms and change the keys. Because if the key has been compromised, then you will have to do that one anyway. So it's better to actually have already implemented this and also document this entire process. So when this happens, you know exactly what to do and you've already done it and it's already documented. When it comes to data in transit, the best, uh, we are pretty, 
we are getting pretty well at uh, encrypting the communication between the client and the server side, especially now with let's encrypt, there is no excuse to not have uh, the transfer over HTTPS. But I still see a problem of uh, the transfer between the application server and non-browser components like the database, especially if this one is be behind the firewall. It is important to ensure that any communication is done over an encrypted channel, including behind the firewall, because there have been precedents when intruders have been on a network. Probably the best case, known case is the Marriott, where the intruder has been there for over four, four years. So you never know what's on the network. But our responsibility as developer, we still have to make it as difficult as possible for someone if they try to get into our own application. So to encrypt the communication between, behind the firewall is as well very important. And the next category of issues that I will uh, discuss are the third party components, or in other words, using software components with known vulnerabilities. And when I refer to these known vulnerabilities, these are vulnerabilities that have been published or, and are available for everyone to see on publicly available <laughs> databases like NVD, National Vulnerability Database. So these are out there for everyone to read, understand, understand how to exploit. Even more, in some cases, they're already made exploits. So it's very easy to automate it as well. Now, in terms of which libraries your software uses and which of this version is vulnerable, there are quite a few tools out there for you to use. There are commercial tools, but there are also free tools like OS Dependency Check that you can start using into your software. But the problem that I see is that there is still a lot of tools out there and the, 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 the software is tested, but when it comes with to this long result of lots of components, it takes a long time to do something about those particular components. And there, there has been a report uh, where over 85% of .NET applications and 93% of C++ applications have at least one component with one no vulnerability. And usually it takes quite a long time to do something about it. So as part of this presentation, I will go a little bit more in details of what can you do to get on top of these components and start upgrading them and even replace them <coughs> if that need, needs be. Now, the type of software that has this problem is the type of software that no developer wants to touch because it's so difficult to understand. It's the type of software that it's very difficult to, it's so easy to break. You change one thing in this part of the software and something else called, breaks in a completely different part. It's the type of software that it's very difficult to test. You might have some manual testing, but it's a, a very low coverage and all of these problems make it so difficult to upgrade and in the end leads to a high level of technical debt. So how many of you have seen this type of software? Quite a few. Okay. Before I will move to what can you do, I'm going to introduce another concept from security and this is the attack surface. Now when it comes to software, we refer to attack surface, all of those points which can be used by an attacker to enter data or extract data from a system. And in security we have a very simple principle which says that we need to ensure that we have a minimal attack surface. Now when we bring in these components, especially the type of components that actually have some interaction 
either with devices or with UI. That's a way to increase your attack surface. So we need to ensure that when we bring it, we do it in such manner that we minimize this attack surface. Let's go through uh, some examples, and I'm going to go through three examples of this type of components. The first one is using an open source library, something that you will always uh, use, like a logging library, commonly used. The next one is using a uh, vendor API, it's something that is, again, used on a common basis. And the third one is using a complex package that has been developed by another team within the same company. And in large companies, you have this uh, way where one team develops a library and then it is reused on a wide range of applications. So let's go through each of those. I'll go I'll start with a login library. And this is something that you would bring in and you'd do on a common basis. When you're bringing a new login library, as a ready-made library, it has a wealth of functionality. And it's highly likely that your software will not need all that functionality that has been there. So for example, in the case of a login library, your application might need only three login levels the one debugging info, and that's all you need. So for this type of scenario, when you want to expose into your software only a subset of the functionality provided, a good software design pattern is the simple wrapper. What this helps you, it gives you the ability to expose into your software only that <laughs> functionality that you need and hide unwanted behavior. If there is a vulnerability, but that is not exposed into your code, then you, your code will not be exposed to that particular vulnerability. So it's also a good way to reduce your attack surface. But also, if you implement this one, and there is a good book about the details on how to do it, and this conference is for tech leads and architects. Um, so you'll already be familiar with this one. There is a good book like uh, Robert C. Martin books, The Clean Code, and it gives there in the uh, clean boundaries the, the details on how you can actually have the unit test. And if it's done correctly, you can also easily upgrade this particular library. And it, if it is not used anymore, if it has been deprecated, you can also replace them without much penalty. And this is what we are looking for, to get into controls of the components that we bring into our library, into our software, so we can upgrade them, even replace them without much penalty. <clears throat> and in the end, to reduce the technical debt, that's all about. The next one that I will uh, go as an example is a payment gateway uh, or an API. Now there is a trend these days. So if an attacker wants to get to a target, but might be a little bit more difficult, one way to get to its target is through a partner. And a vendor API is a very nice example. They can actually get through a vendor API to their intended target. So this can as well be compromised. So when we bring in a vendor API, we need to do it again in such a manner that if something happens, we can change it or shut it down. For this scenario, a good software design pattern is the adapter design pattern because this allows you to have at the same time multiple adaptees. And for example, in the case of the e-commerce, you can actually have at the same time multiple payment um, gateways payment APIs, but if anything happens with one of those, this as well allows you to quickly switch off that one and have your website up and running. So it's another example of another design pattern that can help you to get into, your control, into the control of your software. And the first one, the last one that I'm going to examine, analyze is 
the case of a library that has been developed by a team and now it's um, reused on multiple applications within the same company. And the very good example for this one is the single side on. It can be sometimes quite complicated to bring that one in. And it can be very tricky to actually remove it if you want. So the question is, what can we do about this? For this, a good software design patterns is the facade because the facade simplifies the interaction between your application and a complex subsystem. It gives you that one point that if there is something, it can also be used for um, a legacy application and poorly designed APIs. But the facade, it gives you that one point that if something goes wrong, then you can control it into that one point. And it can hide away details from the client. Now, these are, as part of these analysis, I've just looked at three types of components. And I've just uh, looked at three types of software design patterns. But what I would like you to uh, understand is that the, the security of the software starts from the design, from the point when you choose which, how am I going to implement this library into my software? From that point, the security of your application starts. And you can use a simple wrapper if you want to hide unwanted behavior and expose into your software only a subset of that functionality. You can use an adapter design pattern when you want to have multiple adaptees and you want to interchange them. And for complex subsystem, you can use the facade or also for a legacy application works as well. These are just a free example, but you can actually come up with other software design patterns that might work for you. As long as that you, you ensure that you reduce the exposure of your software to that third party library. And if something happens, you need to replace it, then you can do this without much effort because you, you can upgrade it, replace it without much penalty. Okay, so these are, we have discussed some types of vulnerabilities, not all of them. But the question is, how often should we check for the security controls that we have discussed by now? To answer this question, I'll go through a real example. Rick Rescola was a US Army officer born in Cornwell. After the army, he decided to move into the corporate world. And he worked as director of security at Morgan Stanley in World Trade Center. From the moment he moved in World Trade Center, he was aware that the building posed unusual security risks, partly because of its sheer size, its symbolism, the biggest building in New York in the world. And he wanted to better understand the type of security risks this type of building would pose. Together with one of his ex-army friends, they just started walking around the building. His floors were secure nicely, but when they got into the basement where there was, it was the garage, they saw that the doors were wide open. There were no security guards, trucks, were coming in and out as they pleased. They saw that as a witness into the overall security of the building. He made the report, he filed the report, evidently he was ignored. On February 26, 1993, the terrorists detonated a bomb truck in the basement of World Trade Center. After the attack, he warned again, they cannot come to the basement because now there are huge doors which are closed. The next time will be by air. Because the first time he was right, actually the management believed him the second time. The lease contract would end in 2006, uh, and the company did not want to move until the lease contract would end. But they agreed to implement 
anything that he wanted in, until then. Because for a rick was not a matter of if there is an attack, but when there is an attack, he wanted to have all his people safely exit the building. That was his main objective. And for this, he put in place a regular evacuation drills. So every three months, he wanted to have everyone involved and participate into those evacuation drills. And evidently, there were complaints, in particular, from senior executives. Uh, because what this meant for them, when the drill was on, they had to put the phone down. Sometimes they might be in the, mid, in the middle of an important transaction. They had to put the phone down and then go down the stairs 77 floors. But what he managed to do, he actually managed to change the culture in the end and have everyone involved in these regular evacuation drills. On the day of the 9-11 attack, all but six of the Morgan Stanley employees safely exited the building just as they were trained. Among the casualties were himself and other security officers. But Ricks consistently rehearsed evacuation plans, has saved the lives of 2,687 people on September day 11. What about us? Let's go back to our software, the software that we produce. Because today the software, we have software in cars, we have software in planes, we have software in medical devices. What about this software that we produce? How often should we validate, should we check for this security controls? Every time we receive data, but not only from the client side, also from devices like database, we should validate it at that point to ensure that it's the right format and then the right length. Any exceptions should be logged. Every time we output any data, we should contextually encode it to neutralize any characters that can trigger injection. And every time we save data into the database, we should parameterize the queries to separate the data from the actual SQL command. If we really need to, to use an operating system command, sometimes you don't need, but if you really, really need, you should parameterize the data again to separate between your dynamic data and the actual command that is about to be executed. Every time we encrypt the data, we should store the keys in dedicated key management solutions. And any transfer should be done via TLS, including behind the firewall. Every time we bring in a library, we should choose a software design pattern that help us to reduce the attack surface, exposes only what we need, the functionality that we really need into our own software, and allows us to quickly upgrade or even replace that library if it has become obsolete. And are these the only controls? Not necessarily, because we can also add to this list, and I have added here for example, in the, in the latest OS top 10 2017, there was a new entry, and that was for XXC. The control for that one is to harden the parser. So we can add that control to our list as well, to harden the parser every time we receive an XML document. But it's also important to do this on a consistent manner in order to effectively prevent any vulnerabilities in our software. We have to remember that an attacker needs only one flaw to bring down a system. As builders, we have to defend everything. So what I would like you to take away is instead of actually focusing on these vulnerabilities, which we can measure only after the software has been developed, Instead, we should focus on the security controls that prevent them. Now, as part of this presentation, I have just gone through some, 
But when you go back to your company, have a look at which are the security controls that are relevant for your own applications and have those on a regular basis implemented in your software. And also, it's important to ensure that once we have implemented them and implement them correctly, so we have to verify that they are there and they are correctly put in place in order to effectively change, uh, in order to effectively prevent any vulnerabilities in our software. And what we need to do is just like rigorous Scola, change the culture and focus on these security controls that help us to build more secure software from the start. If you want to have a little bit more, you can actually have a look at the OSTOP of 10 proactive controls. There are more security controls there. Uh, and for the actual details of the, um, how to do various uh, low technical uh, things, you can have a look at the cheat sheet, cheat sheet series to see of how to do a certain task in your particular software. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. And let's do a Q&A session. Ooh, okay, questions? Uh, what is your opinion on network firewall as a security control? I would clarify in the modern world of microservices. <laughs> It doesn't work, and the best example for that one is Equifax. So uh, Equifax is a very good example where that type of vulnerability could not have been prevented. So still upgrade your libraries. So what will we use instead like, nowadays instead of the firewall? What would you recommend? Uh, the security in the software. That's the best one. I mean, the firewalls have been out there, but they have shown that they do not prevent. And there are certain types of vulnerabilities that they do not work for. So that's why putting all these controls into your software is probably the best way to. And at the end of the day, it's not only, uh, these controls are not rocket science. It's just like you validate your data every single time, you parameterize your query every single time. It's just you need to be consistent. And also apply um, clean code principles to make it easier for your fellow developer. Because if he goes into that bit of code and he doesn't understand it, that's when you actually introduce further vulnerabilities and further errors. But if he understands it, what exactly it is about, then he can actually manage the code as well. So you're saying that firewalls, they're like reactive security controls. They react when something's going on. But we should start from proactive security controls, something we built in into our code, into our infrastructures to prevent problems for the first time and then to use reactive controls to limit, to control, la la. Right? Yes. Um, my, my question is about intrusion detection. A, you you actually gave a few examples of when when we should log um, um, attempted attacks, right? So are, are those logs actionable? Because I'm asking because in, in large systems it is very difficult. It, it is it, it's simply not feasible to, to address every every attempt, and that's why we implement protection in yeah. the first place. Uh, that's why I said that you need to also, so the problem in many companies and in particular large companies is there, there is a lack of standards of the logs. If those logs are processed and automated, then you'd be able to get in a more reasonable amount of time uh, uh, to detect some suspicious activity. But if they are not consistent enough, that's when you're going to have problems. No, I'm asking what, uh, what what would you do with, with, with once you detect? I mean, it's not feasible for, for a, in a large system if you have a lot of attempts and log them and assume, uh, let, let's assume the logs are clear and standardized. What do you do with them? 
I mean, are, are they just for forensics, or do you, uh, at some uh, at some level of, of attempts, you, you start doing something about it, or you you, you just cannot react to a, every every single attempt? If you uh, log the right information, and I just gave examples of those, then if that's when that, un that one happens, then you should be able to detect any intrusion. So there, for example, if somebody enters a obvious SQL injection string, that should be detected. And there have been cases when that particular IP has been traced back to a certain person, and then forensics have been in place, yes. You also can distinguish logs and security events, right? It can be totally different things. So you calculate, you grab and store logs for forensics, but you use security events as source of, like, of alerting, and you build metrics on security events that say that delta amount of uh, decryption mistakes, authorization errors, starts growing during the last hour. And this is, yeah, this is something you react. So you build alerts based on some anom anomalies. And these anom anomalies, you can calculate <coughs> grabbing uh, logs or security events and use CM, uh, security information events management systems, like all log analyzers, for example. Any other questions? Questions, questions, okay, yeah. I think I missed, <clears throat> what, what would you say about static code analysis as, as a tool to help teams build in security? So we very <coughs> successfully use SonarCube. Um, it does detect smells, security smells. Um, it has an OWASP plugin used. I um, can't remember what the other one is. Some mm, done by IBM, but it kind of you, you farm off your code off to, off to the cloud and they do some analysis for you and you effectively manage your false positives, et cetera. Yeah. Would that be part of the tool set for you? Yes, definitely. So you have various tools and each tool will give you um, a view and static code analysis is a very good one. Uh, it helps you to actually go at the code level. And if you actually, uh, this is what I actually do a lot of. Uh, and the way I deal with, I actually start of what exactly is wrong and then digging a little bit more into, sometimes I go not only at the code level, but that architecture like that type of flow. So that's a good way that helps you to find vulnerabilities that might not be uh, found with a dynamic or a pen test. So it's a good one. It can help you at architecture as well. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, as a CISO, it's really complex and frustrating to, to use this kind of framework because you cannot control something. It's always frustrating when you cannot be sure that 100% of your population follow the rules and follow the recommendation you, you give. Uh, I think you, you, you talk about that at the end of the talk, so the key point for me is the culture of the company. Uh, what would you recommend to deploy this kind of uh, recommendation uh, along a not big but at least medium society a company? Uh, how can you be sure that uh, all your developers are really uh, aware of what, what they have to do to follow these recommendations? Can you repeat the question? Uh, basi basically, what would you recommend to deploy this kind of framework uh, in a company? Uh, would you, for example, do some awareness sessions just uh, with slides, maybe? Or would you do some games? Would you do some serious games? I don't know. How would you deploy this kind of thing in a company? To build more secure software. Yeah, to, to, to be able to, to force some developers to apply this kind of things. Like how to educate? Yeah, so one of the things that I've done in my company and they really work is some basic web defense uh, and actually help them to think, uh, to help developers to think that their code can go wrong. And like I said, I also ask them to break their own code. That's when they actually see that 
Uh, it helps them to change their mind that things can go wrong with their own code. So yeah, uh, that would be. You would always have as well, some people would like more about this and those should be encouraged. So if you find that there are developers that actually enjoy this, uh, um, encourage them because they can spread the word much better within the developer community. There is an idea uh, of having security champions, right? Yes, yeah. So like people who are curious, it's all, not always developers, it can be like, like any any title, any person with any title, but if they're curious in security, you kind of encourage them and you uh, help them maybe to share knowledge internally, to speak, to educate, la la la. Also when you do, when you try to implement SSDLC, Secure Software Development Lifecycle, you educate developers that security is part of the process as design, like as, pa as patterns, as testing, as quality assurance, la la la. Security is part of this. It's not something you need, you need to do at the end when the application is ready, right? So it's piece by piece, piece by piece. And at some point, developers uh, also may be a good idea to tell them like that not many companies do this. So they're kind of, you know, better than many of them. And on some, po on some point, developer starts to feel like, yeah, we're really cool. We are doing really cool things. Mind games. <laughs> <laughs> so let's probably wrap up and say huge, huge thank you to Katie. Thanks.